This is episode 262 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by Doug Messier. He is uh, with the website Parabolic Arc, and we can talk a little bit about the specifics of what Parabolic Arc does and what Doug writes about at that website. But I will note at the outset here that Doug was a guest previously on the podcast, November the 14th, 2019, episode 147. So Doug, welcome to welcome back to Tipping Point, New Mexico. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you talk briefly about your, uh, you know, your writing and parabolic arc and what you're trying to do and discuss, you know, specifically, it's uh, all about the space industry and private space, but uh, kind of just share a little bit about all, you know, some of the news and issues you follow there and what's going on in that industry today. Well, there's uh, so much going on. I have a hard time keeping up with it. There's a lot of private uh, space activities that are growing um, pretty massively. Um, there's SpaceX just set a record for the number of launches in a year of 26. Uh, there's a lot of private uh, industry going on, uh, private space activity going on. And um, I'm just busy every day trying to cover, cover it all. So it, it ranges from the entrepreneurial small startup companies to what NASA is doing. And it ranges from the, the Starlink uh, satellite constellation that uh, Elon Musk is launching to uh, plans to, to return the astronauts to the moon, which is what NASA is working on now. So the site's been around for about a dozen years and we publish every day. We publish the latest news and analysis. And I live in Mojave where a fair number of things have gone on over the years. So I've been uh, following uh, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic, uh, Strata Launch, uh, Mast and Space Systems is here. We just got an order from NASA to, to land something on the moon, to land a, a spacecraft on the moon. So there's a lot going on here in the desert. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of exciting stuff, too. And of course, I think Falcon Heavy happened during the pandemic. So that, that means it's within the last year. Uh, that's, to me, uh, looking at you know, launches and their public impact, that was certainly one of the uh, very exciting ones. Uh, of course, yeah. we're all going to be looking here at New Mexico because, uh, of course, Rio Grande Foundation is based in New Mexico. But uh, would you agree that that was kind of uh, the marquee uh, space launch of the last year or so? Certainly, uh, and before I let you answer that, the Elon Musk's launch of the Starlink, which is the um, series of satellites for internet connectivity, uh, I remember seeing those traveling overhead here in the uh, dark skies above Albuquerque, New Mexico. And those were also, you know, sometime around April or something. It, it was very disconcerting to see just a, a train of satellites moving across the sky, something I'd never seen in my life before. And, you know, of course, we've got this pandemic, we're all shut down and suddenly out of the night sky comes all these satellites. And I don't follow space as closely as you do, I imagine. So I kind of ha had to do some internet research to figure out what the heck was going on then. Yeah, well, the Starlink constellation is designed to provide uh low band or high bandwidth, low latency um, internet by satellite. It'd be broadband service around the world. So Elon has gotten approval for nearly 12,000 satellites to launch um, for that constellation and has applied for uh, permission to launch 30,000 more. Now that's a, it's a big concern for uh, astronomers because they cause streaks when you try to take uh, images of, of the sky. So um, SpaceX has been working with the astronomers to try to, uh, to darken the satellites to, to prevent that from being a problem. But uh, Elon's not the only one launching hundreds and then thousands of satellites. There's a number of constellations that are going up. Um, 
I think you, you mentioned Falcon Heavy. That was first launched about two years ago in February. I think what you're referring to is probably the, um, the Starship that was launched recently um, down in uh, right. Texas. Right, my bad, yep. And I, I was at the first, um, I actually was at the first um, Falcon Heavy launch uh, almost two years ago. Uh, I watched it from a beach about three miles um, north of there. But the Star, yeah, I mean, the Starship has enormous potential if you can get it to work to, to really transform how we get to space. And we're just at the beginning of that process of, of testing it. Yeah, but definitely some exciting things going on in the industry and from different sources. Now, uh, let's shift that discussion to uh, New Mexico here and uh, what's going on at uh, Spaceport America or not going on more appropriately. Uh, and just for the record, before we do get started, I'll uh, briefly kind of mention that uh, when we did talk uh, in November of last year, uh, I went back and listened to the podcast because I had remembered that you had mentioned uh, that the spacecraft Virgin Galactic was launching. There was you know, potential issues uh, with the engines on those uh, spacecraft, and that was part of the issue with the recent uh, aborted launch uh, at that facility. And you also thought that uh, during 2020, you'd, you, they would be launching commercial space um, you know, launches here in New Mexico. And you know they can say COVID-19 changed those plans, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what's really going on at Spaceport uh, America in uh, near TRC, New Mexico. Yeah, well, on December 12th, they attempted the uh, first powered flight of Spaceship Two from uh, New, from Spaceport America. That would have been the first flight from uh, New Mexico. They had done previous flights uh, here in Mojave, and uh, they had an abort. The engine didn't fire uh, completely, and they had to um, descend and land uh, safely back at the spaceport. And they, they said that that was a, an issue of the computer losing contact with the engine just as it was beginning to fire. So they're looking for the cause of that. There's a lot of stuff to go through to try to figure out where, the, where things got disconnected. But that was, a, you know, it was a, a good test in the sense that they tested the you know, emergency descent and they, they dumped the uh, nitrous oxide oxidizer. So that was, um, you know, it was a, a pretty interesting test. Um, what's really interesting is that this was the first powered flight they'd had in 22 months. And the reason behind that um, was that they had some issues with the last flight. The last flight was done here in Mojave on February 22nd, uh, 2019. And um, Sources have told me that they had to replace the elevons, which are control surfaces that, that kind of control how the ship uh, behaves and flies uh, because they'd had damage. Now, they weren't damaged enough to, to cause a crash in February, but they were damaged enough where they couldn't fly the ship again without replacing it. So that, that took some time. And as also during the downtime, uh, that they had, they were outfitting the cabin uh, with seats and other things uh, with four seats and other um, elements for the for the passengers, and they also uh, improved the flight uh, control system. So they've admitted that they they've got uh, better elevons now and the flight control system and the um, and the seats, but that that just doing the outfitting the cabin shouldn't have taken as long as it as it was and they were really having problems with the elevons and um, so basically they the last one was in late February of 2019 and then they did two glide flights in New Mexico after they moved the, uh, the spacecraft there uh, those were done in May and June of this year and then it took them until December to be able to do a powered flight. And that was supposed to be a suborbital uh, mission. It would have been the third suborbital mission. 
So I don't think that's widely known is, is exactly why they had so much time, why it took so much time. Now, some of that was delayed obviously by COVID and the shutdowns, but really they had, had some other issues to deal with. And they've had, um, they were supposed to go into commercial service around 2007, 2008. That would have been three to four years after the program was announced. And now they're looking at commercial service in probably the second uh, quarter of next year at the earliest. You think that'll happen? I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they, um, they've had eight successful uh, powered flights of the vehicle, including two that went suborbital above 50 miles. And uh, they're planning three more. Um, they're planning three more flights. They have to redo the December flight, and then they're going to do a flight with four uh, passengers in the back. They'll be uh, employees of uh, Virgin Galactic. And then they will um, fly one. Uh, the final test flight, the pl final plan test flight is with Richard Branson, and that would follow um, sometime uh, next year. They were supposed to get all this done by the end of March, end of the first quarter, but it looks like uh, with the delay, they're going to be pushed back into sometime next, later in the year. Now, when we uh, last talked, you had, I had asked you at the end of the podcast if you would go and take a flight if Richard Branson came to you and gave you a free, free flight and you had uh, expressed some reticence and uh, essentially said no. Uh, one component of that was because, you know, just ethics, but I didn't get the impression you had a lot of confidence in the safety of uh, the, you know, the equipment and just the whole system that was going to be used. Uh, do you think that engine issue uh, is what, you know, caused the latest hiccup? Do you still think the engines are the primary issue? Where, What's kind of going on that's causing this incredible slowdown? Well, I mean, they, they had delays with the, having to improve the ship and including the Alavons that control it. Um, and I think the engine has been pretty well tested by now, but uh, they just haven't had a lot of flights. They've had uh, eight flights. Um, they had nine powered flights, one of which crashed in 2014, which I witnessed. And, and they're gonna try to fly commercially with only 11 flights. Now they had a, I've, I've obtained a copy of a kind of prospectus uh, when they were raising money in December of 2008, they needed to raise more money. And they were talking about doing uh, about 30 powered flights with the engine running. Um, you know, suborbital and, and less than that. Um, and now they're down to like 11. So what they were promising investors uh, 12 years ago is different from what they're trying to do right now. And that's, that's a little concerning. And I just, I would like to see a lot of powered flights and I'd like to have a lot of insight into um, how this thing actually performs and how safe it is. And uh, eight flights so far, eight successful flights is not a lot. And 11 is not going to be a lot. So it's, um, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, as they move forward. But uh, there's just been delay after delay uh, for years where they're running about 14, 13 or 14 years behind schedule on their original plan when they announced it in 2004. Um, nitrous and Oxide is a monopropellant that can explode suddenly. I think they've got those problems um, kind of worked out, but there's just a lot of unknowns in this uh, vehicle. And you're, you're going up into a vacuum without any pressure suits. Um, and that's, that's a risky thing to do. They've got some safety features for that, but it's just, um, it, I think there's a lot more risk than people realize. And I've, I've seen the results of what can go wrong. So we'll, we'll see. Well, and, and we centered the last discussion off of a piece that you have written, had written uh, about 
Spaceport America and Virgin Galactic, the numbers never added up. And uh, at that time, you were discussing the very ambitious flight schedule that they had planned over at Spaceport America, which obviously they haven't followed through with. Uh, and now you're saying they're cutting the number of test flights at, you know, at the facility. Uh, seemingly, you know, that would be a concern about safety, but given still the number of test flights that they're expected to undertake before they do commercial launches, at this rate, you know, I would say it could be still a couple years before we get paid customers flying into space. Uh, am I missing something? Um, it depends. Um, if the, the next three flights go as planned, there'll be suborbital flights and probably start in January. Um, you could see paying customers um, next year. Um, if they don't go well and they need to make improvements or changes in the ship, um, further changes, then we could see lengthy delays. It's just uncertain at the moment. Now, I'll give you a few numbers from uh, over the years. Uh, when Branson announced this in 2004, he, he thought he would be able to um, fly 500 passengers in the first uh, year and then 3,000 over the, the first uh, five years of operation. Now, 15 months later, they went to New Mexico and they, they announced um, this plan for Spaceport America. They were promising 50,000 passengers within the first 10 years of service. And that, that would have been by the end of um, 2019 or the end of 2020. So they weren't sure they were planning to start commercial service in 2009, 2010 at the time. So. The, the numbers just went way up when when they asked New Mexico for you know 225 million dollars. That's what they were asking for at the time, and New Mexico said, "Yeah, you know, they, they promised a lot of benefits. They promised a lot of jobs, a lot of investment. That uh, Spaceport America would be uh, a big hub for aerospace and space activities, lots of flights and and things like that." And one of the things that I think was, was sort of missing was any sense of whether the technology was up to that task. And what I'm saying now is, is you still have that question because they just have not flown very often. They've managed uh, this, uh, the powered flight program has been going on since uh, April, 2013. It's now nearly 2021. And you know, they, they managed uh, nine powered flights, one of which failed, they've got three more to go. And um, you're talking about um, the new CEO is from Disney, uh, is talking about um, having 400 flights per year for multiple spaceports, each of the spaceports generating a billion dollars in revenue. That's what he said last month. And that's very ambitious and it's left a lot of questions about what, you know, how many vehicles would you have to have to build to do that? What is their ability to be turned around quickly? How much maintenance and repairs would you have to do? Um, how many spaceports are you talking about? So there's, there's still a lot of questions. And I looked it up and in, in this 2008 kind of information memo for, for investors, um, I talked about White Knight 2s flying three times a day and Spaceship 2 flying once a day with 24-hour turnaround. Now, the, the shortest turnaround between test flights has been in the area of like 72 days between test flights that went to space which was in December 2018 and, and February 2019. So they haven't really turned around these vehicles um, to the degree that they have to. And after the second uh, test flight to space, they had a 22 month gap in powered flights. So um, how robust any of this technology will be and how reliable and how much uh, maintenance it'll, it, they will require is, is all up in the air now. It's still unknown. And I think that's a, a key factor people have to kind of understand about this technology. 
No doubt about it. Well, uh, you mentioned turnover at uh, Virgin Galactic, and there are new personnel both at Virgin Galactic itself as well as uh, the spaceport itself. And uh, let's talk about that. So the new guy at Virgin Galactic comes from Disney. And, uh, you know, of course, we all know what Disney is and stands for. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of pros there. But, uh, you know, anything about this particular gentleman who is now at the reins of Virgin Galactic that you think make him particularly well or poorly suited for uh, uh, the spaceport uh, and space business? Yeah, it's interesting. I listened to the investor call last uh, month. Um, now Virgin Galactic's a public company, so there's pressure on them to fly, which makes me think they'll try to finish the flight test uh, fairly quickly. Um, the interesting thing about this, he spent, I think, 25 years at Disney, and he, his most recent job was overseeing resorts. And when he talked about uh, Virgin Galactic, that's very much kind of the mode he was in. Now, uh, customers, when they fly, they're going to have three days of training, and they will fly on the morning of the, of the fourth day and then uh, have, a, have a big celebration afterwards. So he's really seeing um, the locations they're going to be at, including in Mexico and other spaceports around the world, as destinations, you know, as, as kind of in a resort mode. So these people would, would come in, they'd fly in the night before the training started. They'd have entourages there, large numbers of, of friends and families and colleagues and so on that would want to see them fly to space. And they're going to be there for, you know, four days, basically. Um, so there's a lot of ancillary um, revenues that you can have. I mean, think about going to Disney for four days. What are you spending money on? You're spending money on tickets, obviously, to get into the park. But you're also spending money on all sorts of other things. There's food, souvenirs, and you know, other activities. And if you've got an entourage of people, you know, for a couple of days there, they're gonna have want things to do while they're um, while they're there waiting for their friends to take off. And um, so he's kind of looking at that and the, um, the 2008 uh, info memo that was sent out to investors talked about um, having galactic branded hotels and at the spaceports and they'd have uh, things for, for people to do. They'd have a simulator, they'd have IMAX theater, they'd have rides, they'd have, you know, all sorts of, of stuff. So he's really looking at it that way as a transformative experience that would take several days to do. And while you're there, you're spending money. And you think about vacation, you, you tend to spend money on a lot of things that you might not otherwise buy worry about paying it off later so well you've been down to the spaceport facility and of course at one time disney world and orlando that was pretty much a a total backwater and undeveloped location but you know considering that we are 13 plus years beyond construction of the you know the spaceport and you know, running behind schedule you would think that somebody would have been starting some of this development down at Spaceport America uh, a little bit before now. And there's, you know, you can describe it uh, if you want, but there's not a heck of a lot down there, not just at the Spaceport itself, but there, there's no real cities. There, there's not airport infrastructure outside of the Spaceport itself. I don't know if that's even their plan is to fly people directly into the spaceport and use it kind of as a dual purpose or how that'll all work out. But uh, you know, well, talk I, about the facility itself and how that would all work. Well, I mean, uh, obviously I think the, the plan for New Mexico is to uh, have everybody stay down in Las Cruces, obviously. And, and they've got deals with hotels, I think. Um, there's a hotel in Las Cruces where they've had conferences before New Mexico's heck space conferences. And I, I think Ted Turner has a ranch nearby. So they've had various deals with that. 
and so I don't I don't see a galactic hotel at the at the site given how isolated it is. Um, but I, I do see things going on, you know, in Las Cruces. And since they're gonna be there, you know, three or four days, it's it's flying directly into the spaceport then having to drive an hour south of there doesn't make any sense. I think they'd be coming into Las Cruces Airport. Um, but there's, um, they've got a number of uh, different um, potential deals going on. They've long had a, um, an agreement with uh, the Swedish Space Corporation to fly out of Karuna. And Karuna is um, it's an area, and, uh, it's got its own airport, and they want to turn that into a spaceport and have people be able to uh, fly into the Northern Lights which would be pretty cool. And there's other attractions up there, particularly in the winter. Uh, they're also talking to uh, one of their investors is the, the government of Abu Dhabi. And um, they're talking about flying from the airport in United Arab Emirates. Um, they've also got discussions going on with um, a group in Southern Italy. Uh, that's interested in having flights from from kind of the heel of the Italian boot. There's a town there, so they're they're looking at a number of different uh, locations. So each location is going to offer, I think, it, on the Disney model, the same basic experience of flying to space as transformative four day experience, um, but have different local you know attractions for for people. That, that come along to watch these things. Well, I don't know uh, what they're going to do with Las Cruces Airport, but um, as a New Mexican who has flown more than my fair share around this state and taken people to airports and whatnot, I have never flown in nor out of Las Cruces Airport. We had a speaker once at an event in Las Cruces, and we had to take him down to El Paso. So. Uh, there might have to be, and that's, you know, a good solid 45 minute additional drive down from Las Cruces into El Paso. So uh, even that little basic aspect of just getting people to and from the spaceport from these uh, flights is going to be uh, a, a challenge. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been out there for various things and I normally fly into El Paso and then drive up. Um, but that's you're dealing with some pretty um, pretty rich people, True. so the, the customers would be fairly wealthy. Uh, they're paying two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars or and up for these flights, so they might have private jets that'll come in. They might they might fly into initially fly into well, Las Cruces or um, El Paso. I'm not sure whether they will be flying into, um, into the spaceport itself. I don't know what the, the capabilities are there for, for handling a lot of airplanes, so. Sure, no, I, I get it. Uh, those are things that, you know, I'm not expecting you to know, but it's just a, uh, another logistical trick to the whole thing. So, uh, so we talked about the changes to the uh, Virgin Galactic corporate structure and uh, their management. Uh, but we also had uh, the ousting uh, just a few months ago, back in October, of uh, Dan Hicks. He was the executive director and CEO of uh, Spaceport America. And there were uh, a number of uh, issues that had cropped up regarding Mr. Hicks and his management. And uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, some questionable dealings that he had uh, you know, done while at that uh, managing that facility. So uh, he had a salary of $159,000, according to the Sunshine Portal. And uh, talk a little bit about what issues arose with uh, Dan Hicks and his management of the spaceport. Wow, how much time do we have left? I <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know. I had a very hard time writing this story because there was just so much. Um, they, uh, the state of New Mexico 
Um, well, let me go back. Back in June, Zach DeGregorio, who was the CFO, uh, filed a complaint against uh, Dan Hicks, alleging uh, a number of irregularities. Um, Zach left in um, that same month, and that same month, uh, Dan Hicks was placed on administrative leave. The state government uh, hired an independent um, firm to investigate, to kind of do an audit of, of how things were going, and they just found uh, a whole bunch of alleged things that uh, Hicks and also D. Gregorio were doing. And, there were travel violations. Um, Hicks wouldn't get advanced, um, wouldn't get advanced notice or get advanced uh, approval on his travel. So he did sixty thousand dollars worth of travel in about four years, and thirty-two thousand, at least thirty-two thousand of it was was not pre-approved. So they're accused of backdating uh, re, uh, documentation. Um, Gregorio, Gregorio was accused of uh, approving things, improving travel and also contracts that he had no authority to do. Um, Hicks is accused of um, pursuing things that made no sense whatsoever. Now the spaceship, uh, the Spaceport America was uh, was designed as a commercial uh, venture for suborbital flight, and Hicks spent a lot of hundreds of thousands of dollars of of the um, Spaceport Authority's money trying to pursue orbital um, business, and this orbital business would have had um, these rockets dropping stages over parts of um, <laughs> parts of, of Colorado. And the spaceport had no uh, license, no authority to do orbital flight. The technology for safely doing that's probably a decade or two away. Um, there was no reason to pursue that. Um, he was also pursuing military uh, business, uh, even though White Sands is right next door and it would be competing with uh, his former employer. He used to work at White Sands. So, there's all sorts of things uh, also going on with contracts. Contracts were awarded um, in violation of, of statutes. Um, they put in an RFP for one contractor. They awarded uh, three contractors a uh, business. Um, they also would tell contractors um, that they got contracts before they were officially awarded, which is not what they were supposed to do. Um, Hicks allegedly hired a lot of friends and, and call, uh, people and, and didn't follow state hiring guidelines. So the upshot of this report was that they had violated state statutes and, and laws and both of them, both the CFO and the CEO and um, the auditing firm recommended that the state pursue criminal and administrative charges against both men. And apparently the, um, the state is, um, has already um, uh, asked the state attorney general to do so, to investigate the matter. So there could be criminal charges coming up and administrative uh, charges against two of them. Now Hicks denies that you know, this stuff in the report is true and that he ignored the law and, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. And one of the things he's accused of doing is, is lying to the um, economic development uh, secretary, Alicia Keys. Keys asked for a, a kind of strategic plan for the spaceport. He said one existed when it didn't exist. And then he, he never, he never gave it to her, he never provided it. So also the, um, the board chairman, Rick Holdridge, um, former board chairman, Alicia Keyes has taken over uh, from that, uh, on that job uh, overseeing the board of directors. Uh, he really didn't do a very good job of um, oversight. And he just allowed um, violations to continue and, and was very hands off and, 
expected them to to get the job done and didn't didn't pay a lot of attention to legal niceties. Hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Lujan Grisham administration tends to protect its own, and uh, uh, it would be interesting. You know, not that Dan Hicks is by any stretch an insider, but they have tied a lot of their prestige into the spaceport and making it successful. So I don't think they will go after Mr. Hicks like perhaps he would be, but um, he would be, you know, it, it, they could. It sounds like he's done some pretty naughty things. And, uh, you know, thanks for sharing those with us. Now, uh, kind of getting into the last few minutes here before we go, uh, I, I don't know if you consider it a bright spot, but uh, there was recently an announcement uh, from Spin Launch that they are increasing their presence yet again at the spaceport. Uh, Spin Launch, you know, uses kind of a different technology. It's not what the facility was built for in the first place, but they seem to have uh, had some success and they're uh, increasing their presence at Spaceport America. Can you briefly talk about anything you know about Spin Launch? Um, I don't know that much about them. I know that they're, you know, basically going to, I guess, centrifugal force by spinning it around and then kind of tossing it into space. But um, I'm not sure if that even works. And and there's some of the people I've talked to are pretty skeptical about whether that's uh, that's actually going to work. But it's um, probably the uh, it's a very unique approach to things. So. <laughs> But uh, it's interesting that they're hiring, and um, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, actually, things like spin launch are kind of an example of how how the the field has kind of grown. There's a whole lot of different um, launch um, it, uh, launch companies that have started up. There's uh, more than a hundred are pursuing uh, small satellite launches. Uh, you've got Spin Launch, you've got uh, Virgin Orbit, which is a Branson company doing air launch. Um, they're probably going to launch again next month. Um, you've also got uh, a new company that came up um, that's, that's going to try to launch a rocket by drone. It's going to have this massive drone that will take off from a runway and then launch the rocket from, from the air. And that's supposed to uh, cut down a lot on the number of uh, employees, the number of people that you need to launch. So there's there's all there's all sorts of churn that's going up uh, that's going on in, in the launch industry. And um, I think with uh, Virgin Galactic you see the, the problems um, that that can crop up. Um, I used to work in Silicon Valley and you have a lot of startups and some of them become huge like Google and other ones like, like Facebook, and then you have companies that don't really uh, perform. And you have a lot of companies that uh, eventually just go under. And I was part of a, a startup that went under. So there's a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of um, uncertainty. And the spin launch, we're just going to have to see. Um, it's a net positive for the spaceport because they've got a tenant there that's expanding. So um, they can point to that as, um, it, you know, getting just getting off of the um, it's just complete dependence on Virgin Galactic. Right. Yeah. Um, that's certainly been my impression all along is that the success or failure of Spaceport <laughs> America is tied to commercial manned space launches happening on a pretty regular basis out of that facility. And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, something that we still haven't really seen them achieve anything even remotely like that. And, you know, we're still waiting and still paying the bills. And uh, you know, uh, need I mention that New Mexico is uh, one of the poorest states in the entire country. So it's, uh, it's yeah. very frustrating and, uh, you know, very skeptical that this is going to work out in the end because uh, it tends to be the things Relating to New Mexico's economy don't work out in the end. Uh, the state didn't get to 50th by accident. And, uh, 
Well, it, yeah, I mean, Richardson and the legislature took a huge risk in 2005. And you're risking on a, a technology that was still very immature. This was based on an experimental vehicle that flew into space uh, three times in 2004, um, Spaceship One, the predecessor to Spaceship Two. And, you know, it just, nobody really realized, I think at the time, how difficult this would be and how immature the technology was. And the key problem they've had is scaling up um, what was an experimental small vehicle, very risky to, to a much larger vehicle capable of carrying, uh, you know, up to six passengers and two pilots. So the setbacks they've had, um, are, are just a matter of the technology just not being very mature at the time. And I think Richardson just kind of had this opportunity to do something. They had been talking about a spaceport down in southern New Mexico for a long time, and he, he just jumped at this and, and didn't necessarily do a lot of uh, due diligence on it. All right. Well, any last comments? That sounds like a pretty good uh, way to summarize things, but I do want to give you a quick opportunity to say anything else you feel was left unsaid here in the final moments. Well, now I'm, I'm working on a, a story that should be out soon, um, looking at the different promises over the years and, and what Virgin Galactic has, has said that they were going to do uh, in terms of numbers of flights and things like that. So that should be done in the next uh, couple of days. So Look for that right. at parabolicarc.com. All right. Well, thank you very much, Doug. We will see where things take us down at Spaceport America. Uh, hopefully they get some successes and, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're all hoping that this works out. But from a public policy perspective at the Rio Grande Foundation, we are obviously skeptical that this was ever a good idea for taxpayers to be on the hook for. So... All right. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.